Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Oh, come on. How are we doing this morning? Yeah, that's what I like to hear. Welcome to Vineyard. My name is Pastor Parker, and if you didn't know, I am the pastor in charge of the youth ministry, so normally upstairs we do our own service for high school and middle school students every single weekend. Uh, just a, a tidbit there. But welcome. Uh, just so you know a little bit about me, I've been attending Vineyard for about eight years now, and it's been an insane ride. <laughs> you know, there's something about trusting God with your life that's sometimes beautiful, sometimes messy, but it's always good. Uh, and speaking of messy, we've been in this series called Families Are Messy. And you're probably thinking, I could have told you that. You know, let me come up there and talk about how my family's messy. <laughs> you're, you're so I, I feel you. And, and, and families do get messy, right? Especially large ones, big families. My father is the youngest of five siblings. And so by the time that my parents had me, some of his oldest siblings had kids who were starting to have kids. So our family was pretty big. And I remember going to family gatherings, not really knowing everyone's name and having to be like, so who was I just talking to again? <laughs> and, and, and so with that large size, drama was just bound to happen. You know, people have friction with each other. Friction leads to drama and drama, you know, you know where it goes. It gets messy. And, and, but, you know, at the end of the day, though, his family, I mean, they love each other to death. Sometimes literally, you know. Not always figuratively, um, but if you're, you're following along on Twitter, you're taking notes today, you can title today's message, Dealing with Dysfunctional Siblings. And just so I can get a gauge of, of who's here, if you're the oldest sibling, why don't you go ahead and raise your hand for me real quick. All right, shout out to the oldest siblings. Are right, you got any middle children in the house? All right, what's up? The youngest siblings, where are you guys? All right, and the beloved only children, got a few. Hey, let's give it up for the only children. God bless you. <laughs> I've got a picture of my family. I'm the oldest of three boys, and, and that's our family. We took that on Easter. This is where you say, aw. It's a, it's a beautiful bunch of people. So I'm the oldest of three boys. Uh, my middle brother, Josh, he's 21. The youngest, Logan, is, is 15. And they came on Easter, and I told them I was preaching in May, and they got that series flyer, and they were so excited for me, and they asked, so which week are you speaking? And I said, May 20th and 21st. And so they look down, they read the title, and then they look up at me, and they kind of have this, oh, shoot, look on their face. <laughs> it's like, what are you going to talk about on this one? So growing up with boys, you know, it meant a lot of fights. A, a lot of stuff went down in the house, and it, it, particularly Josh and I, but we were three years apart, but by the time we got into elementary school, we were about the same size. So I was a little bit taller and skinnier, but he was bulkier. And so when we would fight, I was faster, I could outmaneuver him, but he could overpower me. So a lot went down. And then on top of that, we shared a bedroom for most of our life. So you know fights happened. We fought over the TV, we fought over food, toys, video games, the beloved front seat of the car. <laughs> How many parents have had to deal with those arguments? <laughs> you get it on the way there, I'll get it on the way back. No, I want it both times. <laughs> And so we would fight a lot, but one time in particular, uh, we were playing this game called Manhunt in our neighborhood. And if you don't know what that is, it's kind of like tag, but it spans across the entire cul-de-sac, sometimes the neighborhood. So it's not just limited to one yard, but everyone's yards. So I apologize for those of you. <laughs> um, and so we were playing, me and, me and Josh were on one team, and then our friend and his cousin were on another team, and we were running away. They were the taggers, and so we were running away, and we thought of this great idea. It was technically out of bounds, but we were gonna hop the fence and run along the main road 
because they wouldn't be able to see us. There's this big privacy fence that went all the way down the neighborhood. And so I climb up to the top, I look left, I look right, and, and no one's there. And so, cool, I jump over and I look again just to make sure the coast is clear. And I say, all right, Josh, come on over, hop the fence. And so he climbs to the top, and as he's about to jump over, his right leg clips the top of the fence, breaks it, and he falls flat on his shoulder. And you know, being the loving, respectful big brother that I am, I looked at him and I said, dang, you okay? <laughs> and he mumbled something. I said, all right, cool, get up, we've got to go. You know, they're gonna, they're, they could be here in a second, let's go, we've got to go. And so we have a brief argument over whether he's okay or not, but eventually he musters up and we, we move forward and we get around the corner back into the neighborhood and he sits down on the curb and I see that he's crying. And I go, oh gosh, <sighs> we're going to lose. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and then so I'm thinking, okay, maybe something is wrong. And so instead of admitting that I was wrong, you know, I strategically asked him a question. I said, so should we go home? <laughs> And he said, yes. And so we, we left and we went home. I don't even think we told our friends. You know, they still, they could be looking for us right now. Who knows? <laughs> you know? But we went home and, and long story short, he broke his collarbone. And so he had to wear a sling. And coincidentally, football season had just started and he loved football. And that was heartbreaking for him. He wasn't able to play. He went to the games though. He even, I wish I could have found the picture. He went to picture day. And he's wearing his sling, and he looks so miserable. It's, it's, we used to keep it on the fridge, too. It was so funny. Uh, but he couldn't play. And, and normally, you know, you would feel heartbroken for your siblings, like, dang, he broke his collarbone. But for me, I was thinking about how I was supposed to go to the mall and hang out with my friends that night. And because they were at the doctor with my brother, I couldn't go anymore. And so I was thinking about how his inability to hop a fence kept me from going to the mall. And I want to talk about this uh, this morning, how sometimes we let problems, we let issues disrupt our view of reality, disrupt our view of what God wants to do in our lives. Uh, so speaking of that, we're talking about dysfunction. And now that problem, when it comes to boys, that's normal stuff. We went through broken collarbones, stitches. Uh, one time I accidentally headbutted him and his tooth jammed into the top of my head. Um, so stuff happens all the time when it comes to boys. But when we talk about dysfunction, now that's a little different. What does functional mean? It means it works, it operates, it's good, it benefits us, it has healthy systems, it has healthy relationships, it, it produces a healthy product. But when we talk about dysfunction, that's something that's abnormal. It's something that doesn't work. It's not the best. It's not the best choice. It misses the mark. So in order to have a dysfunctional sibling, a dysfunctional person or friend, man, not only do you have to make bad decisions, but you have to have a history or a reputation of making bad decisions. It's one thing to make a mistake. It's another to be dysfunctional. And, uh, you know, but we, we all make mistakes, right? The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all, everybody, we all are messed up. So if you're taking notes today, I do have a thesis, a tweetable thought. You can tweet it, post it on Facebook, Instagram, Tinder. I don't judge. <laughs> Just kidding, don't do that. Uh, and the tweetable thought today is this. My purpose is not limited by dysfunction. My purpose is not limited by dysfunction at Vineyard VA. See, I feel too often this dysfunction in our lives, whether it's ours or somebody else, man, it makes us lose focus. It makes us not see what we're meant to do. It makes us put things on hold that God is calling us to move forward with. You know, we, we have thoughts like, gosh, my brother got injured and now I can't do what I planned. Or my sister's not a good enough mom, so I have to care for her kids and, and waste my time on her kids when I should spend it with my own. Or getting deeper, you know, my brother, my sibling, my, my friend, they have that addiction. Their life is a mess and their dysfunction rubs off on me and now I don't have time to do what I wanted to. See, we all have dysfunctional people in our lives. Some are more intense than others. Some of us are those people. See, how do you respond to that, though? How do you move forward? How do you deal with that dysfunction? Well, in order to answer those questions, I figured, why not look to the Bible, right? Can I do that this morning? So there's a story about a family in, in, in the Bible that has an enormous amount of dysfunction. And every time I read this, I think, God, thank you for my siblings. I love them to death. And so this family in particular, you may be aware of the story or not, but it follows a man named Jacob. And now Jacob has 12 sons, 12. 
And so 10 out of the 12, out of jealousy for Jacob's favorite child, decides, you know what? We're going to take that favorite child. We're going to sell him into slavery and tell our dad that he was just uh, demolished by a wild animal. Something happened to him. So they do that. And they come back to their father and, and they tell him what happened. They, they say, oh, you know, your son, he, he disappeared. Animals, they tore him apart. And we learned a couple weeks ago from Pastor Randy about this favoritism that Jacob had and it destroyed him. He loved this son and this son was Joseph. Joseph, it was his favorite. And he was, man, he was destroyed. It broke his heart. And uh, he never gets over this loss. And so we fast forward 20 years later. 20 years every day of waking up thinking that his son is, is no more. His son is gone. And then not only that, but Joseph's brothers have to live with the decision they made every day. So there's this phrase that says, time heals all wounds. It sounds great. It sounds ideal. But the truth is, I, I, I want to give you another thought. Dysfunction breeds over time. Dysfunction breeds over time. You see, when we hide mistakes, when we hide secrets and issues, it just allows those mistakes to creep into other aspects of our lives. It allows it to, to breed. It allows it to grow. Unaddressed dysfunction grows over time. Now, I was a psychology major, and, and something that we talked about in college was unaddressed guilt. So when you've, you've done something, you feel guilty about it, but instead of addressing it and trying to solve it, you kind of push it to the side and hope that one day you'll get over it. And some of those symptoms, they occur in two, two types. So the first type's involuntary. Things you do just out of reaction. You don't even realize that you're doing it. And then the second type are defensive mechanisms that you try to hide up those, those first types. So some of the first types are, are depression. It's anxiety, anxiety insomnia, self-hatred, uh, finding obsessions to, to, to ease your mind. And that leads us to escapism and trying to get away from that guilt and doing things like uh, drugs or alcohol or relationships. We try to mask those feelings. And see, maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you've made a decision in your life that you regret and you're afraid to tackle it. You're afraid to move forward with it. You're afraid to, to grasp it. See, I'm sure that's what Jacob's sons thought too. They thought, you know what, just one day we'll be fine. One day he'll get over this. But they find themselves in a period of famine. So the whole land that they live in and, and the surrounding areas are without. There's just not enough food. And so they're working, they're harvesting, they're, they're, they're you know, trying to raise up their, their crops and, and their uh, cattle and, and stuff. But everything they do just isn't enough. It's just not going to be enough for them. And so this is where we find ourselves in Genesis uh, chapter 42. And so it picks up with this. It says, when Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers, the same 10, went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin. Now, Benjamin was the youngest son. Joseph's brother with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. So, so much happens in this, but the first thing Jacob says is, why are you looking at one another? Why are you staring at one another? What's that going to do? Have you ever had a secret? Or maybe you bought a gift or you have a surprise for someone and you've told a friend. You're like, you're both in on it together. And then that friend comes around and they kind of hint towards that secret, but you don't want to let them know what it is. So you make eye contact with your friend. It's real brief. It's maybe a split second, but you just had an hour-long conversation with your eyes. You said, this is the plan. We're not going to tell them. Don't talk about the secret. Cool, let's go. And then you move on. That's what their brothers are doing. I feel like they're like looking at each other thinking, oh gosh, we made a mistake. We've got to act like everything's okay. We've got this. We're strong. Nothing happened. And then get this. Jacob won't send his youngest son, Benjamin. He won't send him. Not because he's like, oh, I just need someone to help around the house while you guys are gone. Jacob is afraid that the past will repeat itself. He's afraid that another son will be lost and he can't lose his youngest. We all know the youngest becomes the favorite eventually. <laughs> he's the last to do everything. <laughs> and so his precious son, he's like, I can't send Benjamin. And so uh, what happens is this unaddressed dysfunction, it never went away. Jacob was never healed. He's still dealing with the same stuff right now. And so uh, the brothers, they, they get to Egypt, and, and once they're there, surprise, Joseph didn't die. He's now the governor of Egypt. 
Talk about some misfortunes turned into blessings because of the favor of God. And this is where we find ourselves in Genesis 42. It says, now Joseph was governor of all the land, second to the Pharaoh. And when he was the one, and he was also the one who sold to all the people of the land. So if you needed food, you had to go through Joseph. And Joseph's brothers came and they bowed down before him and, and with their faces to the ground. Now Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and he spoke roughly to them. He said, where do you come from? He said, they said from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. So Joseph starts to question them. He's testing them. He's like, I wonder if this is the same people that sold me into slavery 20 years ago. I got to make sure that they're okay. I've got to make sure that they're not trying to, to get me again. And so he pulls them closer and he has conversation with them. And they tell him, you know, we're 10 brothers of 12. Uh, one is back home and one is no more. And so Joseph, loving his youngest brother, he loved him so much. He says, I need to verify who you guys are. Go back home, get your youngest sibling and bring him back here. So I know you haven't lied to me. But so that I know you're going to come back, you have to leave one of you in jail with me. And so, of course, they freak out. They're shaken by this. They, they start to talk amongst themselves. And, and this is their conversation. It says, then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, talking about Joseph, and that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we did not listen. This, that is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. So up until this point, the only damage they saw was their father. They didn't know what was going on with Joseph. And so they feel now that they have to make an atonement for this issue. They have to, they have to solve their guilt. You see, but because God is faithful and spoke a promise to Joseph that one day the stars and his family would bow down to him, man, God turned that mistake, turned that dysfunction into a blessing. See, Joseph gained favor with the Pharaoh and now leads all of Egypt. But in this moment, we see that everyone is kind of stuck in time. Joseph's brothers are now confronting their 20-year-old sin. And Joseph, even though in his blessing to some degree, is stuck wondering, do my siblings hate me? Do my siblings still have a grudge against me? And so typically we can relate to this story. We're either on one end of the spectrum or the other. We're the brothers We've made some mistakes. We're unsure of how to move forward, of how to solve those problems. Or we're Joseph. You know, we, we had mistakes made to us, and we're unsure how to handle that. Now, I've been working in, in youth ministry for se about seven years now to some extent. And, you know, they say child care is the best birth control. But I disagree. <laughs> Emotional horno, hormonal teenagers, that's the best birth control. You see, over these seven years, I've seen so many young people come through these doors, all with different stories, different, different things going on in their lives. And a lot of them are crippled by the weight of their family struggles. You see, believe it or not, students actually feel the weight of their parents' struggles. They feel the weight of their sibling mistakes. But because they're young and unsure, they're not sure how to cope with it. So they act out in different ways, in rebellious ways. So to what us seems as rebellion to them is a coping mechanism. See, and I know you're sitting there thinking, but Pastor Parker, how do I deal with it? How do I combat it? How do I say, what do I say to make them okay? See, I'm going to tell you something that you may not have expected to hear. But in order to get rid of dysfunction, it starts right here. It starts in you. You. You are the cure for dysfunction. You see, we have to stand before God. We have to call the dysfunction by its name and say, you know what? Nothing, nothing is going to get in the way of God's plan for my life. Nothing is going to get in the way of the purpose that he has for me. This dysfunction does not have a hold on me or my siblings or anyone else. You see, you've got to look at that issue and say this dysfunction is merely a hurdle. You know, that bottle is merely a hurdle. That past relationship is merely a hurdle. Those marital problems are temporary. It's merely a hurdle. You know, see, God doesn't call us to survive circumstances, to scrape through, to get by. God calls us to conquer our circumstances. He wants us to jump that hurdle, clear that bar, and land on our two feet strong in his promise. Man, he will be there for you. He will strengthen you in those moments. But how do we do that? 
I've got three points for you today, and I promise you, if you take these three points, you pray over them, you reflect over them, God will do something powerful in your life. Point number one is this, faithfulness. Faithfulness triumphs over dysfunction. Faithfulness. See, imagine yourself as Joseph. He was sold into slavery. That should be the end, right? Sounds like rock bottom to me. But Joseph had a God-given dream. He stuck with God. He was faithful as a servant. He was faithful in jail when he was falsely accused. And God gave him favor among the Pharaoh, among, um, among the prison guards. He gave him favor and blessing. And then he found himself in this position of authority because he was faithful. See, church, you need to call that dysfunction by its name. Know that he who began a good work in you sees it to completion. It's a promise of God in his word. See, no promise goes unfulfilled unless we let it. If unaddressed dysfunction breeds over time, don't wait a year. Don't wait two years. Don't wait 10 years when you think you'll have time. Start today. Start now. Deal with the dysfunction now. Address it today. Hebrews 12, verse 12 through 13 says this, Therefore strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so the lame may not be sick but be healed. God, that's crazy, right? If you want someone to step out of dysfunction, step into the promise that God has for them, man, you've got to be there first. You've got to be there. First. You can't call them deeper into dysfunction. This, this verse literally says, God has empowered us to pave a way for people, has empowered us to, to pave a way for those who are lost and seeking to follow us toward, closer to what God has for them. You, you are empowered to do that. So you're about to see why Joseph's pursuit of God was so crucial to his brother's redemption. You see, his brothers return home and they tell their father what happened. And of course, he's devastated again. Now one is in jail and you want to take my youngest back to Egypt. This can't happen. I will not let this happen. You will not take Benjamin. And so his oldest, Reuben, he pleads with him and he says to his father, kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands. Trust me, I will bring him back to you. But he said, my son shall not go down with you. And so they wait a little bit to let their father cool off and they actually end up eating all the grain so they need more food. But they say, Father, we can't go back unless we have Benjamin. And so his other son, Judah, steps up. And then Judah said to Jacob, his father, he says, send the boy along with me and we will go at once so that we and you and our children may not live or may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his safety and you could hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him here before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. You see, the oldest steps up to his father and says, take everything I have. My two sons who will inherit all of my possessions. That is my future. That is my line. Take it. And that sounds really great. But then Judah steps up and he says, you know what? I'm not going to give you what I have. I'm going to give you my life. Put it on my life. Blame me. If Benjamin doesn't come back, my life is yours. That's insane, right? Uh, my point number two is this, sacrifice. Sacrifice triumphs over dysfunction. Sacrifice. You see, we think to ourselves, why do I have to sacrifice if it's not my problem? It's not my dysfunction. So what do I have to do about it? But the truth is, if it wasn't our problem, man, we wouldn't be heartbroken. We wouldn't lose sleep over it. We wouldn't be torn. It wouldn't affect our lives at all. But it does. And so we have to address it. Let's look at it this way. We know covering up doesn't work. <laughs> we know ignoring the problem doesn't work. Judah and, and Reuben knew that a sacrifice was necessary, that a promise, a ransom was necessary. And what's crazy about this is that out of the 12 brothers, thousands and thousands of years later, Jesus is born. He doesn't come from the line of Joseph. He doesn't come from the oldest Reuben. He doesn't come from the beloved youngest Benjamin. He comes from the line of Judah. The man who was willing to lay his life down for his brother spawns a line that, that, that is birthed the savior of the world who lays his life down for us. It's no coincidence in that. Romans 12, 1 says this, here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Him meaning God. The best thing we can do for God is to embrace a life with him, to live sacrificially every single day, to live our lives as an offering to God. But what if we took that hymn at the end and we replaced it with our sibling's name, our friend's name, 
someone at work's name. The best thing we can do for them is to embrace a life with God. To, to step into the purpose that God has for you, the plan that he has for you. The best thing you can do for your siblings is to start there. That's crazy to think, right? God wants to use us to get rid of dysfunction in other people. He wants to use us to portray his work on the cross. He wants to partner with us to spread his good news. You see, it's not going to be things like money or clothes or cars or houses that's going to get rid of dysfunction. It sounds great. Let me buy you a new car. Let me pay your mortgage. Those are blessings, definitely. But if this dysfunction is deeper, it's going to take something godly. It's going to take something a little bit more powerful than those things. See, the brothers return to Egypt with Benjamin. Their, their father agrees to what Judah said, and Joseph sees them, and he's overwhelmed. And he tells his servant, prepare a meal. We're going to dine at noon. And so they part ways, and then they come back for the meal, and the brothers have brought gifts because they still don't know it's Joseph. And so they're trying to make sure that they're good in his graces. And so they bring these gifts, and they present him for him, and Joseph, you know, acknowledges them, but he starts asking them questions. And it says here, it's a very interesting question he asks. In Genesis 43, he says, he asked them how they were. And then he said to them, how was your aged father you told me about? Is he still living? Because even though I'm at this high level of authority, God has blessed me beyond understanding. I have not seen my father in 20 years. Because of what you did, because of your dysfunction, I don't know my dad. I don't know if he's alive. Is he okay? In the brothers reply, they say, your servant, our father, is alive and well. And they bow down, prostrating themselves before him. And as he looked at them and he saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son, he asked, is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved at the side of his brother, Joseph hurried out and he looked for a place to weep. And he went into his private room and he wept there. See, Joseph's two worlds are colliding here. He's been living in God's blessing, but he's now confronted with his 20-year-old dysfunction. He's overwhelmed. This dysfunction, though the catalyst towards his blessing, has left him without knowing his father or his youngest brother. See, some of you here have experienced things in life that just are not fair. They're beyond your control. And because of this dysfunction in your life, it's caused you to live without healthy relationships, a healthy job, a healthy family. But most importantly, a healthy relationship with your Father in heaven. Because of what someone else did, you pushed God away. You pushed his purpose and his plan for you away. You pushed his conviction away from you. And I'm here to remind you, just like Joseph, your father is alive and well. He's waiting for you to come home. You see, Jesus tells this story in the New Testament about a father with two sons. And one son goes to his father and he says, I need my inheritance right now. Divide it up. Give me my portion. And so the father divides the inheritance between two sons and, and the, the one son takes all that he has and he goes off to a faraway land, probably the Vegas of that time. And so he's gambling his money away. He's buying, you know, nice classy food. You know, he's spending it on, on women or whatever it is. And he finds himself completely depleted. He's broke. He's got nothing. And so in order to make money, he starts to work for a pig farmer. Glamorous, I know. And so he's working for this pig farmer, and then he looks down at what the pigs are eating, and he realizes that the pigs have better food than he does. And then he thinks about his father's house and how his father had servants, and they eat better than he does. And so he thinks, you know what? I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home to my father. And of course, he's really nervous. He's scared because he abandoned his dad. And when he gets there, this is what the Bible says happens. In Luke 15, it says, So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. His dad ends up throwing this huge party for him. They celebrate. His son is home. And of course, the other brother gets jealous. He gets angry. You know, he's been there the whole time. He never left his dad. He was faithful. He served. He worked. But he never got a party like this. And so he leaves the party anger, angry, and uh, his father comes after him. And this is what his dad says to him. He says, my son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because your brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So that appeals to some of you. You're thinking, I'll never be accepted back into God's house. I've made too many mistakes. My dysfunction is too great. It's just not going to happen. 
But Jesus tells this story to demonstrate the fact that God doesn't punish us when we return to him. He celebrates us. He celebrates our return and our faithfulness and our sacrifices for him. See, what, about, what does that say about us when, when others return in our lives? When our siblings or our friends step closer to God, that means we celebrate them. We don't get angry. We don't get bitter, but we celebrate. You know, I shouldn't have been upset that my brother broke his collarbone, regardless of what my plans were, you know? I should have been happy he was alive and something worse didn't happen. That he, all he has to do is wear a sling and it will heal if he does the right stuff. You know, he couldn't go back into playing football. He couldn't cover it up. He couldn't ignore it. It would have gotten worse, but he healed. See, the first step was faithfulness. We have to be faithful with God if we want others to experience the same favor and, and love from God. It starts with us. The second step was sacrifice. Man, Jesus gave his life for us on the cross, so we should do the same for others. Live every day sacrificially. And this is my last point. Forgiveness triumphs over dysfunction. Forgiveness. You see, Joseph is the other son in this story, and his brothers have returned home. And a lot of people say that Joseph, with this next part, gets revenge, but I don't really see it that way. So what happens is Joseph prepares their bags of grain, uh, uh, and, and he sends them on their way. But before he does, he hides his royal cup in Benjamin's bag. And so while they're on their way, he sends people after them and says, you've stolen from Joseph. You know, you've stolen from the governor. And they get really scared. Of course we didn't. We would never do that. And they find the cup in Benjamin's bag and they come back to Joseph and he says, I'm sorry. You stole from me. Benjamin's got to stay here with me as my servant. But you, the rest of you, you can go home. You're free. And this was it. This was the test. Everything Joseph has done has led up to this point. Will my brothers abandon Benjamin? Will they leave him here with me and take their freedom? Or will they save him? Will they redeem themselves? And so, of course, the brothers, are, are, they're shaken. They don't know what to do. They plead with him, please, our father will surely die if we do not come home with him. He loves him. Please let him come with us. And Joseph's like, I'm sorry, he's got to stay here. And then Judah steps up again. And the same thing he told his father, he says, Sir, Lord, let Benjamin go. Take me instead. I will be your servant for the rest of my life. Take me. Let Benjamin go. And Joseph, uh, being overwhelmed, he clears the room of all of his, his servants and he pulls his brother in close, or, or all of his brothers, and he says this to them. He says, come close to me. And when they'd done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. And they did it. They repented. They redeemed themselves. And Joseph looks at them not with bitterness, not with anger as he would, you would assume he would deserve. But he looks at them and he opens his arms and he receives them. He celebrates his brothers returning home and he praises God for taking this dysfunction and making it useful, making it powerful. Did you catch that? He said it was to save lives that God sent me before you. Dang. You see, too often we assume dysfunction takes away our purpose in God, that it strips us of our ability to do something great. But just like Judah laid down his life for his brother to redeem them, Jesus laid down his life for us to redeem us before God. And so in the midst of your dysfunction, in the midst of all of that stuff, when we come before God, faithfully and sacrificially, he says, guess what? You've already been forgiven. You've already been forgiven for what my son did for you on the cross. See, whether you're the cause of dysfunction or you find yourself there by a series of misfortunes, God celebrates when we return to him. Be encouraged today that God wants to use you to rid people of that dysfunction, to influence the people around you. You know, families may be messy, but let God make that mess a little bit smaller through your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning, Lord. God, I thank you that no one is here by accident. No one is here by coincidence, Lord, but you had a word for every single person here, God. I ask that we wouldn't forget your favor, Lord. God, I ask that we wouldn't forget uh, what you've done for us ahead of time, Father, that you've gone before us, Lord, and prepared the way. 
You know, right now, if you felt like God was speaking to you in this moment, you, you've never made that decision to trust God or you, it's been a while and you want to make that decision again, you know, just at your seat or, or in your heart, I want you to pray this prayer with me. We say, Jesus, I know I mess up. I know I make mistakes, but would you make me new? Today I trust you. Today I follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vmchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.